My name is Adam Goldberg. I'm a pet photographer in Tampa, Florida. <laughs> 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 I've been photographing pets for eight years. In this video, I'm gonna show you my go-to lighting setups, but also how to work with a pet too. When starting out with pet photography, Getting your lights dialed in is important, but also knowing how to work with the pet is probably one of the biggest questions that I get. How do you get the pet to sit still? How do you get them to look at your camera? My biggest trick, rather, is to use treats. Treats are really important. You can start out with, you know, like a cookie or a, a meat-based treat, something really high value that your pet, if you're photographing your own pet, that you know that they're gonna love. If you're photographing someone else's pet, it's really important to make sure you ask them if their pet has any food allergies. You don't wanna give a pet a treat that would make them sick. When it comes to treats, what works best for me is small treats that are probably about this big. You don't wanna use big treats because it's gonna take them a lot of time to eat it. So if you're trying to get photos in succession, them just eating the treat, it's gonna take maybe 10 seconds. The smaller the treat, it might take one second, so you don't have to wait for them. If you're worried about a mess, let's say you're doing treats in a studio or in your house, try and use like a meat-based treat versus a cookie. Cookie's gonna crumble, it's gonna get messy, it's also gonna take them a lot of time to eat it. If your pet isn't feeling the treats that you have, we use something called like a high-value treat. So you can use cheese, which we use all the time in the studio. Some people even use hot dogs. We use hot dogs sometimes at the shelter. If a dog is really uh, not loving the treats that we have, we'll try and up it. So. Upping the quality of your treat, if what you have is not working, will, will help a lot too. And then the treat, as you see in this video, we use the treat to kind of get the dog to look where we want it to look. So if I have a treat in my hand, I'll kind of move it to the camera really quickly so that way if they're looking off to the side, I can direct them really fast and I put it right above the camera lens. If I want them to look to the left, I'll kind of do it to the left if they're looking off in the distance, but I'll really kind of move my hand really rapidly um, if I'm doing it slow, it's not as uh, effective as what I found. So high value treats and moving the treat literally right on top of the camera line so they look into it. But if you wanna get like a fun expression, peanut butter is really great. One important thing to realize about peanut butter is that if it's sweetened artificially with xylitol, xylitol is bad for dogs. You wanna make sure your peanut butter is xylitol free. Most peanut butters you get at the store, at like a typical grocery store, not a uh, health food store or something like that is gonna be fine. The other tip with peanut butter is, if you're using it on a dog that you don't know, maybe you're starting out at a shelter, we like to put it on a spoon. Um, dogs I do know, I'll use my finger because I have a little more control, but if it's a dog you don't know, you don't want them biting your finger. Most of the time that doesn't happen, but it's always important to be safe. So if you're trying to get a certain expression from a dog that you're photographing, whether you want their mouth open or you want your mouth closed. We were photographing our dog and I know that she loves treats. So she tends to keep her mouth closed because she's salivating and really wants the treat. So instead of using the treat and we wanted to get her mouth open, we used a toy instead. Luckily, our dog B is both toy and food motivated, so we were able to use those interchangeably. Sometimes dogs can be picky with treats and then I'm telling you to use a treat and they don't like treats, what are you gonna do? You can use a toy. Most dogs who are treat motivated, love treats, they love toys, they really love toys. B, we're lucky that she likes both. But if you notice that your dog is keeping their mouth closed, try using a toy instead if you're going for that mouth open, happy look. In addition to treats to get your pet or any shelter pet to look at the camera to have a fun expression, we use one of these. This is a toy squeaker. Uh, you may have seen it if your dog destroys uh, you know, a fluff toy. We actually buy these in bulk because I lose them all the time. So we're not just, just destroying toys, but uh, it works great. You'll get a head tilt out of a dog usually. I kind of do it subconsciously now, but I'll use it to get the dog back on track. So if the dog is really focused on treats and I want them to kind of settle down, I'll squeak the toy and then the attention will get drawn to the toy and I can kind of wrangle them back in. And I will have this in my hand I have my camera right here and I have treats in my fingertips. So I'm reaching into the bag, squeaking, giving treats all at the same time. So I've been doing this for a while now. 
But having this little squeak toy, which you can buy online in packs of 20, huge help. So if you're just starting out with pet photography and you're wondering what camera gear to use, when I first started, I had a crop sensor camera, used Canon, and I had a 35 millimeter lens. With the crop factor, it's right around 50 millimeters. And the benefit of that is that you can be within arm's reach of your subject, of the pet. If you're using a telephoto lens, like a 24 to 70 or a 70 to 200, you're gonna need to be much farther away and you can't physically interact with the dog yourself. If you have a crop sensor camera, go with a 35 millimeter. If you have a full frame camera, I would recommend maybe a 50 millimeter. That way you're getting that true distance and again, you can be within arm's reach of your subject. So my go-to lighting setup for at our studio or at the shelter is now the FJ400. It's a strobe light. When I first started with pet photography, I used constant lights. And if you're just starting out and you're not sure what equipment to get and you're just trying to figure out photography and pet photography, you might wanna check out constant lights because those lights are always on. What you see is what you get. The other thing for constant lights when it comes to pet photography, there are times where the pet that you're photographing, whether your own pet or a shelter pet, is they could get scared by the flash. Sometimes it's a one-time thing only and they realize the flash isn't gonna hurt them or there's no reason to be scared of it. Other times there's no recovering and the pet may just be too scared of the flash. So if you're trying to make a living at pet photography, you might wanna have both. But if you're trying to just learn, constant lights is good. And then once you master working with the pet, maybe graduate to something like the FJ400, which is not only great because it's battery operated, if you're doing photos outside, or if you're in a place where power outlets aren't nearby, you don't have to plug it in. This is my key light. I use it off the battery only. We do have other lights that we can talk about that we use as rim lights. Those are plugged in just for ease of use. They just happen to be near an outlet. I like to have them plugged in, but I don't have to. So having a strobe with a battery is not only convenient for on location shooting, but it just makes it a little bit easier to not have to rely on power. With our constant lights, we had to have power outlets. They're long cables. With pets around, we would have to tape them down. And sometimes we would be setting up our studio on location, sometimes at a, a bar or even a brewery. Bars or breweries have painted floors sometimes. We would use gaff tape and would pull up the paint. Not having to tape down wires by having a battery operated light not only prevents cables, dogs are not gonna trip on it, but we don't have to ruin the floor of the place that we're at too with tape. When it comes to modifying the FJ400, my preference is the Okta M and it's a rapid box, which means it's really easy to set up. When I was doing constant lights, I would use a rod-based softbox. And if you've used a rod-based softbox before, you kind of have to bend the rods in there and it would get stuck and you would, have, you would hurt your thumb sometimes. But with this, it uses a Bowens mount and you can actually connect it really quickly. You can kind of push in the softbox, it expands and it's really fast, especially on location to get it set up, you're shooting within seconds. So with the rapid box, it comes with two layers of diffusion. One is called the inner baffle, and then there's an outer layer. Having that inner baffle with the size softbox that this is, is really important. If you didn't have it, you're probably overpaying for this size softbox. The light will hit the inner baffle first, and then it'll spread to the outer diffusion to make sure that light is expanding the entire softbox. So I have to be honest, I didn't know that, and I watched another Westcott video and realized that I was not using this properly. So having that inner baffle in there is really important to make sure you're getting the light spread that you want uh, with this Okta M. So for our lighting setup, if you're just getting started, what we started out with was one key light. This is a light that we usually have overhead. Sometimes we'll do like a 45 degree angle, but it messes with the catch lights and they become uneven. So our main light, we use the FJ400 as a key light. And again, if you're just starting out, I think that's plenty. We recently added rim lights in the back and strip boxes to kind of create separation from the dog and the backdrop. But again, if you're just starting out, having one key light is plenty. And once you've graduated maybe from constant lights and you're ready to step up to a flash, highly recommend the FJ400. The battery lasts forever, probably three or four hours worth of shooting. And luckily I have other FJ400s that I could just swap out the battery. So having that battery aspect, it's rechargeable. And then there's actually a battery indicator on here. So you can see I have two battery indicator lights on here. So I know that 
I probably need to charge this soon because once it gets down to one, I'm gonna be out of luck if it dies, but luckily I do have other ones so I can just swap it out easily. If you wanted to step up your game a little bit, what we've done is given it a more professional look, especially for our shelter photos because we really wanna get attention to those on social media, we've added one by three strip banks on either side and that's called a rim light. And the reason we use that is to create this extra separation from the pet and the background. The reason we do that is to, again, create a more professional look, but also it just makes the photo a little more appealing. Always trying to step up my game with photo quality. So, you know, next time you see me, I might have 10 lights, who knows? But right now we have three to kind of make it that professional look. So on those one by three strip banks, you'll see that we have grids on them too. The point of the grid is to really narrow the focus of the light so it doesn't spread. I'm really trying to hit the side of the dog, like right here and right here. If I didn't have those grids on there, the light would spread. It might get into my camera because it's also behind the dog. I don't want that light spilling into my camera lens. So this may be a more advanced tip, but I, again, am really focused on the catch lights to make, their, make sure that they're even. So dogs with lots of fur, especially dogs with eyebrows, you know, um, will block the catch light. So we have to like comb their hair back. And sometimes it's, you have to adjust your light to make sure that light is hitting the catch light. In pet photography, maybe in, in all photography, but I, you know, specialize in pet photography, getting those catch lights in the eyes is so important. Whether they're even or not, maybe you're not quite there yet, but making sure you have some catch light. You don't want those dead eyes because it just takes all the life out of the photo. So tip number one for catch lights is just make sure they're there. And then tip number two, if you wanna elevate it, make sure that they're even. That's what I strive to do is make sure that they're even. So I kind of obsess over those catch lights, maybe unnecessarily, but uh, having them there in general is probably a good way to start. So once you've mastered your lighting and you've mastered positioning, if you wanna step it up, get some really fun photos, we like to throw treats in the air and capture that. And it, you can see the dog's like eyes bulging out of their head. You need to have a really fast shutter speed if you're relying on shutter speed. There are ways to do it where you set your lights in a different way, but I prefer to do with shutter speed. So I'm using maybe 2000, 4000, 6400 level shutter speed to capture this action. When you're outside, you could do the same thing. Having dogs run at you is a popular uh, trend to do on, on pet photography too. And you wanna have your camera set in a way where the focus is like on servo, AI servo, if you're a Canon shooter. Having that continuous autofocus set in your camera, you'll be able to capture that action. And then we just throw treats in the air. We use peanut butter sometimes to capture action. And peanut butter and cheese, when we do shelter photos, that's a fun way to get out an expression to try and get that pet adopted. So we do a lot of action photos. Doing a portrait photo is nice, but getting a, uh, a little personality in the action is, uh, is really great too. So you'll notice that we also use a platform. B, our dog, is a small dog. If you have a larger dog, you don't need the platform. Again, it's kind of going back to that catch light conversation where if she was low to the ground, that catch light's not gonna hit her in the eyes, it's gonna hit her on the top of her head. If you had a bigger dog, the catch light should be fine. So we raised her up a little bit and was able to do those action photos on top of a platform that we created. Uh, we put a towel down just so it's a little bit softer for her, but doing the platform allows us to, again, get those catch lights, but it also, as a tip, keeps her in one place. So usually if a dog is on a higher level, if they're a smaller dog, they're gonna stay in one place. So you might see when you're training your dog, big or small, that a trainer would use like a doggy platform that platform is great to kind of keep them focused in one spot. So if you're having trouble and you don't have an assistant, try putting them up on something. We used a uh, garage shelf that we kind of modified to be a platform, but you can use anything. Um, we've used a gear case before to use as a platform, but having them raised off the ground, even a little bit, is actually a really good way to keep them in one spot, especially if you're by yourself. In addition to the platform, when we were photographing B, we wanted to get a full body look, but we wanted to get her running at the camera. B is trained well, so we were able to put her in a sit and a stay and have her run at the camera. We put our treats right by the camera lens and she ran right to it. Not all dogs are trained, especially shelter dogs, to sit and stay. So what you saw Mary, my wife, doing is kind of luring her with a treat and then kind of accelerating her action right back to the camera. And it got B really excited and her paws were kind of crossed and it just, 
made for a more action-y type photo and more compelling than just kind of sitting straight and looking at the camera. So if you're trying to step up your poses, doing some sort of action shot to the camera with an assistant will give you some variety in your shots too. When it comes to action shots, if you're just starting out, when I first started out, we used constant lights and you can put your camera in burst mode and maybe take 10 to 15 photos in a second, depending on your camera. And then you can just pick out, you know, the one that you want with those eyes bulging or the, or the mouth open. When you're doing with strobe lights, the way I like to do it is a one-off. And that means I'm really trying to get my timing down because it can be a little tricky. So it may take a little time to get like when I'm tossing the treat in the air, making sure I take the picture at the same time. It, it can be a little tricky sometimes. So I'll have a, lot, a few misses. Um, so I have to kind of figure out the dog's timing also. It's different for every dog. So it's not like you can count and say, okay, I'm gonna toss it, then throw. You have to figure out how fast the dog is gonna try and catch the treat. So with constant lights, it is a little bit easier. However, with constant lights, you have to have a, a high shutter speed, but that means you're cranking up that ISO. If you have a high ISO, you're gonna have a lot of noise in the photographs, which is actually the main reason why I switched to the strobe, the FJ400, because it's so powerful that I don't need a high ISO. And that way the image quality is just so much better. So if you want to start out with action, maybe try those constants. You're gonna to have to have a high ISO. Once you're ready, go to the FJ400. Your ISO is gonna come way down. The image quality is gonna go way up, but you have to be better at your timing. So those are my tips for lighting and positioning the dog that you're working with. But one tip that I should mention also is having patience. Dogs, pets in general are very intuitive. And if you're feeling any sort of anxiety or if you're photographing someone else's dog and their owner is feeling anxiety, that pet is gonna pick up on it. And that's gonna make your job as a pet photographer very difficult. So always remember, have patience because if you're not getting the shot that you want, your dog's gonna lose patience and maybe they're gonna get full with all the treats that you're giving them. So take a break, come back the next day, try again. But I would always recommend uh, having patience. Another tip that I would recommend is practice, practice, practice. When I was working at an animal shelter, I was taking photos of shelter animals and I had the luxury of working with animals for five hours a day, all different types of behaviors, all different types of uh, comfortable levels with the lights. So if you're taking photos of just your dog, it may not be enough to get a well-rounded kind of practice with pet photography. Ask friends, go to an animal shelter. You're gonna get a lot of practice with different types of animals in a short amount of time. But if you're only doing it, you know, every other day or every weekend or just on your pets, it may not be enough to really get you to where you wanna be. So get as many pets as you can, ask friends. Pet, people are gonna want photos of their pets. If you're just starting out, that's how I started. I just asked my friends if I could photograph their pets and eventually, you know, got good at it over the years. But that's my probably number two tip aside from patience is practice on as many animals as you can get in a short amount of time. So you can go back to your computer, look at the back of your camera, make adjustments, and then learn something um, through that process. Thanks for watching this video. If you're interested in more free tutorials, subscribe to Westcott on YouTube. If you have any questions about pet photography, we'll hang out in the comments of this video. And you can also DM us on Instagram or find us on Facebook. We also spend time at the animal shelter every other week, so look out for photos. You never know, you could find your next favorite furry animal through that too.